Okay, everyone, welcome to GIA Knowledge Sessions, a series of seminars on gemology fueled by our decades of research. I'm Stuart Overland, Managing Editor of Gems and Gemology. And today I'll be joined by two of GIA's brightest stars, Sally Eaton Magana, Senior Manager of Diamond Identification. And she'll be followed by Nathan Renfro, Manager of Colored Stones Identification. And before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Everyone attending this session will be automatically muted. If you have a question, please submit using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. There will be a Q&A session at the end where Sally and Nathan will answer some of your questions. We'll also be sending you a recording of today's session. And in that message, there will be a survey and we would love to hear your feedback. Our session will cover recent highlights from three sections of the journal, Lab Notes, Microworld, and Gem News International. Now, each one of these sections contains dozens of brief entries, and they only take a few minutes to read, so you'll always come away with new knowledge to add to your toolbox. Today, we'll be covering highlights from our two latest issues, Spring and Summer 2020. Now, both of these got delayed by the global situation, but I'm very pleased to tell you that both of them have been printed and have been shipped to our subscribers. They're available now. And we're completing our fall 2020 issue now, and that will become available in early January. Sally and Nathan will be presenting GIA's findings on diamonds and colored stones. Of course, GIA has examined a lot of interesting pearls lately, but because we have two issues to cover this hour, we'll save pearls for a future session. So, Let's begin with diamonds with Dr. Sally Eaton Magana. Take it away, Sally. Thank you, Stuart. And hello, everyone. The first diamond we're going to be talking about today is one that shows cavity, it has cavities showing radiation evidence. Uh, this is a, a 0 0.7 carat E color diamond. It had I1 clarity but natural color origin. On the right of the image, you can uh, see an example of one of the, of the inclusions. Raman analysis of these uh, verify that the crystal was a composite of the minerals uh, wallastonite and bryite, which indicated a sublithospheric or origin. It also had uh, disc-like graphitic fracture, fractures due to exhumation from the mantle. Uh, this stone is one more example of diamonds forming at the incredible depths of 360 to 750 kilometers be before being transported to near the surface. But after even traveling from those depths up to near the surface, the earth wasn't finished writing the story of this diamond. The next slide shows that while it was in the earth's crust, the diamond was exposed to radioactive fluids particularly in etch channels, now in the form of cavities on the table and the crown facets. We were first clued into this when, as part of our normal testing, uh, Diamond View imaging uh, revealed fluorescent green halos around those cavities. And that indicated that those had likely been filled with a radioactive fluid. Uh, there was none of the greenish color radiation staining that would likely accompany higher radiation doses. So we did some photoluminescence mapping to learn more about the fluorescence, and that's what's showing on the right. Uh, the plot shows a line scan across the cavity and shows much higher intensities of the nitrogen vacancy centers and the GR1. Uh, the extent of the fluorescence halos and the elevated GR1 is approximately 30 microns, and that's consistent with the penetration depth of alpha irradiation. The next diamond we're going to talk about is one that showed uh, corundum inclusions inside a gem diamond. Uh, this uh, 0 uh, 0.13 carat round brilliant uh, has an interesting story under the microscope. On the right, we can see a corundum inclusion exhibiting a slight pinkish color. To our knowledge, uh, the only previously recorded occurrence of chromium bearing corundum, that is ruby or pink sapphire as an inclusion in gem diamond was nearly 40 years ago. So here, the author report the second identification of a chromium-rich corundum in natural gem diamond. Uh, this diamond had a pe uh, peculiar chromium doublet emission in photoluminescence, which what clued the gemologist first into the fact that this was a special diamond. And so it was sent to the Carlsbad laboratory for further testing. It 
ended up containing at least five internal inclusions and they were all positively identified as chromium rich corundum, uh, as, either as ruby or pink sapphire. Uh, the next slide uh, confirms the inclusion as corundum with Raman spectroscopy. And then on the right, we can see the fluorescence reaction. Uh, ruby and pink sapphire uh, typically exhibits a red color when exposed to long or short wave uh, UV due to fluorescence from abundant uh, chromium impurities. And we can see that for this, for this inclusion. The next diamond we're gonna talk about is really interesting because this diamond is a piece of jewelry in, of a, in and of itself. Uh, this carved uh, fancy dark gray diamond weighs 13.15 uh, carats. Uh, this ring was fashioned from a 196 carat diamond from Canada's Northwest Territories and named the Beaufort ring. It has a mixture of dark inclusions and colorless viewing windows. This ring made entirely of natural diamond was submitted to GIA's New York laboratory. This diamond is a very rare diamond type, type 1AB, and owes its fancy dark gray color to graphite needles, which is shown on the next slide. These were trapped while the diamond was formed deep below the earth's surface. Uh, and then fluorescence imaging on the right uh, uh, for the ring using diamond view showed dislocation networks that also confirmed its natural origin. While this diamond ring is certainly not a traditional piece, it has many unique aspects and captures a gorgeous snapshot of Earth's history. The next diamond that we'll be talking about is one submitted here to uh, the Carlsbad lab. Uh, we examined a one carat uh, fancy deep greenish blue diamond that had been artificially irradiated, but it also showed some unusual, unusual gemological features. Uh, the diamond spectra and imaging uh, showed it was artificially irradiated followed by annealing. On the previous slide, uh, the photo at the right shows a uh, color was concentrated at the coolant, which we often see in artificially irradiated diamonds. Okay, And then as with most elaborated diamonds, it was irradiated with the table side down. And then thus the coolant facing the beam received the highest dose of irradiation while much of the table facet was comparatively protected, protected. On the next slide, the irradiated pavilion shows orange fluorescence due to a high concentration of nitrogen vacancies, uh, that is NV centers created by the treatment. Uh, irradiated diamonds are often given some low temperature annealing after irradiation in order to stabilize the defects. However, we generally do not see evidence of these NV centers forming from the post-irradiation heating. Nevertheless, for this one, uh, we do see treatment conditions that created this NV-related fluorescence on the pavilion and the crown. Meanwhile, the original blue fluorescence of the natural pre-irradiated diamond persists on the table, which was shielded during the irradiation. The table experienced a lower radiation dose fewer NV centers formed as a result. And we can see this transition from the orange NV fluorescence um, around, the set, around the periphery to the original blue fluorescence in the middle of the table. And then thus that creates uh, an intriguing fluorescence image for this diamond. Uh, the next slide shows photoluminescence maps of the nitrogen vacancy centers at 575 and 637 nanometers. These maps show the concentration of the NV centers and mimics what we would expect based on the fluorescence results. That is that the highest concentrations are along the periphery and on the crown, and then the lowest is at the center of the table. The next time that we're gonna be talking about is a 4.05 carat rough diamond crystal. And this was submitted as rough, and we saw that it had radiation staining on both sides. The image on the right, uh, the upper surface has the green stain uh, closer to the bottom of the image, whereas on the lower surface, that is slightly more out of focus, uh, has the green stain uh, towards the top of the image. And then the arrows indicate the direction of the displacement that it occurred while it was in the earth, which are in opposing directions on opposite sides of the rough crystal. That is it. While it was within the earth, the diamond tilted slightly and changed where the diamond was being irradiated. 
So when initially formed, uh, these radiation stains are green in color. And if they are subjected to heat, the stains will turn to a brownish color. This particular diamond had both the green and the brown radiation stains on the surface. Nearly all of these stains existed in pairs, one brown and one green, and the same shape. Uh, when the diamond crystal is shifted slightly, the radioactive minerals create a new stain of the same shape, but slightly displaced. The next slide tells the stories of three radiation pairs. Uh, stain A has dark, almost black coloration in the center with dark green and brown color around the periphery. Stain B shows green and brown radiation uh, stains, but with a colorless section between them. And then stain C has very light uh, radiation staining. So in stain A, the diamond Raman peak was quite broad and distorted within the radiation stain compared to the surrounding diamond. But both B and C showed indications of less radiation diamond compared to stain A. The brown portions of the radiation stains displayed features closer to the intrinsic diamond, such as lower diamond width of the radiation stain, which is uh, you can see in the the photoluminescence map for stain A. Uh, these features suggest that the time and temperature that created that transition from green to brown uh, as the diamond was shifted to the new position also brought about some, you know, what we're calling healing from the localized radiation effects uh, detected within the green uh, rad stains. Uh, the sample was interesting scientifically as it allowed some direct comparison of radiation stain features created by the same point sources. The next diamond uh, we're going to talk about is a 3.02 carat HPHT grown diamond, which was submitted to GIA's New York laboratory. Uh, its color is fancy vivid pink. The next slide shows strong color zoning uh, related to its typical hourglass synthetic growth structure. Uh, fancy color HPHT grown diamonds will often show that hourglass structure, and this one is no different. On the right is a diamond V fluorescence image showing, showing strong red fluorescence due to the nitrogen vacancy centers. And, and this is a typical cause of color in lab grown and in treated pinks. The next slide shows the stable color on the left. However, on the right, it shows the result when it's excited by shortwave uh, UV. The nitrogen vacancy centers are bleached and desaturated, which results in a hue shift towards orange color. Uh, this is a temporary color change uh, between the red and the orange or the pink, vivid pink and the orange. And within minutes, the diamond will revert back to its stable pink color under normal daylight conditions. Next up, I'm gonna hand over the reins to my colleague and manager of colored stone identification, Nathan Renfro. He's gonna speak on some fascinating diamonds that he studied before segueing into colored stones for the remainder of our time. Nathan? Thanks, Sally. Uh, the first time I'd like to talk about is um, one that it, it seemed like it uh, made its way around social media and got a lot of attention uh, due to the interesting property they had. And this stone had um, a mobile diamond inclusion inside of the diamond host. And because of this sort of uh, nesting pattern, it sort of got the name of a Matroshka diamond uh, after the Russian nesting dolls where it's, you know, one doll inside of another doll inside of another doll. And so uh, this diamond was pretty interesting to examine. It was um, slightly green in color. It weighed about 0.62 carats. And, um, and there's an explanation for why is there a mobile diamond inside of the diamond? At least that's what we uh, wanted to uncover. And so this, this diamond was uh, submitted to the New York laboratory where uh, Wu Yi Wang and colleagues uh, examined it. And then it was sent to Carlsbad to examine here also and take some photographs. Um, and so what we have here is a, a core diamond and there's an open space in this area allowing the, this core diamond to actually move around. And so uh, this the photomicrograph here shows um, this open channel where dissolution occurred as the diamond was transported to the surface and the interface between the host diamond and the guest diamond uh, was enlarged such that it created this open space allowing the, the core diamond to move around. 
so here's an animation of, of the diamond inclusion uh, in the host. So this was a series of images taken with the host stone registered in the same position and then um, allowing the, the internal diamond to kind of rattle around. And then all those images were assembled together in this anim animation here. Um, diamonds with mobile diamond inclusions in general are extremely rare. Uh, as far as I know, there's been at least four documented. Um, and this one uh, is probably one of the more spectacular examples, but not the only example that we had in this issue of GNG. &G. There was also this diamond here, which um, this stone is part of the John Cuevla inclusion collection. And um, it was first encountered by uh, Robert Crowning Shield and um, back in, I think it was in the, in the 80s. And it has this negative crystal here that's, so we're looking at a polished surface uh, uh, through to this kind of etched negative crystal. Um, and there's this, it's green in color due to radiation staining. And inside this cavity here, which is open to the surface, just like in the previous diamond, uh, but this cat, this opening is a little bit bigger. And if you look down in the opening, what you see is this little green diamond um, nested in that cavity. And this image pair shows that um, the diamond is actually free to sort of rattle around inside that cavity. And so in the same manner as the Matroshka diamond, um, I took a series of images and had them animated into a video so you can get a better sense of uh, how mobile this inclusion is. So here you can see the green diamond uh, inclusion. Um, you can see it, how it moves around inside the inside this open space. And again, this is a result from um, dissolution as the diamond traveled to the surface. And so you have areas with, with high defects, which would be the interface between the included diamond and the host diamond. And so those areas dissolve away faster. Um, and it didn't dissolve away enough to make an opening large enough for that inclusion to come out. So it's now trapped inside that host diamond. Okay, now we're on to colored stones. So in the lab notes section of G and G, um, that section is basically uh, dedicated to interesting things or um, that we see in the laboratory or things that the trade should be aware of, new treatments, new materials, and or even um, stones that are unusual for their, you know, the type of stone it is, or uh, maybe it's got a particular feature about it that's, that's atypical. Um, and this, this piece of glass was really no exception. And so usually when we think of glass, um, you know, glass can be any color and it makes a great imitation depending on what the color it is. So this green glass made a pretty excellent imitation of emerald just because of the body color, but it also um, had another feature about it that made it a good imitation of emerald. And that was that it had lots of clarity enhanced fractures. Now, typically we don't think of glass as being um, heavily fractured because um, you can just, you know, it can be cut from a solid piece. It's inexpensive. You can get it in large sizes. So there's usually no need to have clarity enhancement, but it seems that the, in the case of this particular green glass gem, um, that the fractures were induced and then subsequent, subsequently clarity enhanced. Um, you know, and you can see in the photo here, these are trapped gas bubbles in the filler. Uh, and then there's another uh, gas bubble here, which is in the, the glass host itself. So it's easy to identify this as glass, uh, but if you're not careful enough and you don't take a refractive index, seeing these sort of filled fractures could give you the impression that it's actually a natural emerald. So, uh, you know, careful gemology is, is certainly important as you're identifying stones. And this was a particularly good imitation of an emerald because of the clarity enhancement, uh, the treatment itself. Here's another stone that was unusual that came through the lab. Um, in 2015, there was, um, a deposit of grandidiorite, which is a rare mineral found in Madagascar. And, and that deposit had a lot of really gemmy, transparent, um, facet grade stones. Uh, but there's also other material that's available in pretty large sizes. Uh, 
typically lower quality, heavily included. Uh, but this was a, a, the largest example of grandidiorite we've examined in the lab at 763 carats. So quite a large stone. Unfortunately, the quality is not you know, that good. It's, it's quite opaque and heavily included, uh, but still quite the novelty based on the size and the, the rarity of the mineral itself. Another strange um, stone that came through the lab is um, this bismuth glass filled Burmese star ruby. And this came through our Hong Kong office. And typically when we think about uh, glass filled rubies, you think it's, it's commonly lead glass filling. But in the, in the case of this stone, there was no lead detected using X-ray fluorescence, but they did detect um, uh, bismuth as the primary dopa in the glass. And so typically the glasses are doped with these elements so that you increase the refractive index so that the refractive index matches that of the host material, which in this case is corundum. Um, we don't often see as many uh, star rubies that are glass filled. So that was a little bit unusual in this case also that, that we have a star ruby. And if you look here right on the stone, you can see this, this cavity here that was filled with glass and there's a a large gas bubble that was cut through. So, so that make, made the glass filling pretty easy to spot as far as the, that goes. But the chemistry analysis is what determined that it was bismuth glass filling instead of lead glass filling. Here's what the, the stone looked like uh, using CT scan, or uh, I think it's x-ray. Um, and so you can see the, the bismuth glass and see that it's, it's quite prominent throughout the stone. And so if this glass filling was removed, the stone would probably fall apart into several pieces. So this would be a manufactured product in the laboratory. In the micro world section in the spring issue, we had some interesting stones. Um, this, was, this was a rock crystal quartz that had um, these little white puff balls of a mineral that we identified as bavanite. Um, and so this was the first time that we had documented uh, bavanite as an inclusion in quartz. And uh, this stone was came courtesy of uh, Mike Bowers. So just kind of an interesting novelty collector stone. Also in the micro world section, uh, we documented this really unusual and rare synthetic gem material. Um, and this material is called neodymium pentaphosphate. It was developed for laser applications. Uh, it was really an experimental type project. Um, and it was first documented in, I think, 1997. And it wasn't successful as a laser material because it had this property of elastic twinning. And that's, and I say elastic because you can apply pressure to the stone and you'll develop lamellar twinning throughout the whole stone and even hear this sort of audible slight click. Um, and so when you, we're exam when you look at the stone in polarized light, it allows you to see this, this twinning throughout. So these, are, um, these three images show the stone in the same position, but with um, different pressure applied to the corners of the stone. And so you see the twinning sort of come and go. And there's also a video to, to really show um, how strange and unusual this material is. And so, so my fingers are here at the corner of the stone and I'm just kind of giving a slight twisting motion and a little bit of pressure using polarized light. And you'll see this twinning, this lamellar twinning sort of come and go as the stones um, compressed and, and slightly twisted. So, uh, really a rare sort of experimental material that was essentially a failure for its intended application, but um, quite a novelty for gym use. Um, this material was quite interesting to examine. This was palisitic peridot um, from the Japara, Japara meteorite um, in Indonesia. And uh, this suite of um, Peridot came through Bradley Payne, who selected these stones because of their unique inclusions. Uh, and they all contain these sort of iridescent needle-like inclusions, uh, which are really quite, quite pretty and colorful. And so this was just a fun suite of uh, really rare uh, extraterrestrial uh, 
material. You know, this is Palisadic Peridot is the only gem from outer space. So uh, quite a unique opportunity to examine this material. This was another um, fun note in the micro world section uh, by one of the Carlsbad staff. And um, this was really unusual because we have a blue sapphire that displayed this phenomenon that resembled play of color like you would expect in something like opal. And the stone contained this, what we would call a milky cloud here. So when you use fiber optic light, you can see this kind of hazy cloud structure. In transmitted light, um, you see the, this sort of graining pattern where the cloud was. But when you examine the stone uh, by rocking and tilting it in that area where the cloud was, you have this, this sort of vibrant interference color effect that changes as you rock and tilt the stone. So here you see a little bit of red and some greens coming in, more green and then blue. We were also able to get a video showing this effect. It takes just a second to tilt the stone here. So look in this center area here. As, and then as the stone's tilted, you'll see the, the colors change. So um, this was a pretty rare example of a play of color type effect um, you know, it's presumed that the, the, the small particles in the cloud-like structure uh, behave similarly to opal where they diffract the light, creating these kind of uh, vibrant interference colors. Uh, but an interesting phenomenon in an in a interesting sapphire, so certainly unexpected. Another microworld uh, entry for the spring issue. So every issue we um, we have sort of a uh, we like to feature a rough crystal, um, and that's dedicated for the quarterly crystal. And so in this issue, the quarterly crystal was this pale yellow triphane spodumene, and inside the spodumene there was this rather large orange crystal of something. And so uh, here's what it looks like. In the, in the microscope. So you can see that it's subsurface and the, the surface of the, the crystal, since it's rough, is actually you know, quite etched and uh, not overly transparent. So it's hard to see the details of the inclusion. And so in order to identify this inclusion, we would normally take the stone to a uh, Raman microscope and collect the Raman spectrum and then match that with a database. Uh, but in the case of, of this stone, uh, the inclusion was too deep and the sample surface was, was too poor to, to resolve a clear Raman spectrum. So what we rely on is really the, uh, the observations in the microscope, which is you know, we look at the color of the, of the inclusion, the morphology, the optical behavior. And so um, this was a singly refractive in inclusion, sort of orangey in color. Um, and so it's, and, and also if we consider the geologic environment that this grows in, the conclusion is that this is probably a spessartine garnet. Uh, however, to confirm that, the next step would be to polish the surface down. Uh, but since we didn't want to damage the, the crystal, because um, it's a nice specimen as it is, uh, we opted not to do that. So it's likely a garnet, but, um, uh, we weren't able to conclusively identify it based on the limitations of the, the crystal itself. Um, for Jim News um, in the spring issue, uh, we had uh, interesting material written up by uh, Jennifer Sundberg. And these are bulls of corundum. And uh, it's clear that they are unusual because of this sort of striped pattern. And so what you have are these bicolor rough corundums where where as the crystal's growing, the feed powder has a change in the dopa so that you get zones of different colors. So in the, in the red zones here, the dopa would contain chromium and then in the yellow zones, it would probably contain something like nickel. And so, so as they alter the dopa, they get this heavily zoned bulb, which makes sort of a nice novelty stone. And so here's an example of one that was cut. Um, this stone contained cobalt, uh, which was responsible for the for this sort of turquoise type color, and and this end over here contained chromium. So you have this sort of uh, purplish color um, resulting from the 
chromium from the pink or from pink from the chromium and uh, the cobalt producing a blue to give you this sort of a bicolor purple and this sort of electric uh, greenish blue, bluish green kind of color here. Uh, here's the interface between the, the two zones where they, um, they um, change the dopa in the feed material. So this is the, the reddish section that has the chromium. And this section over here contains the cobalt. And these little inclusions and in gas bubble-like structures have this blue solid phase, which is uh, likely a, a spinel structure, um, cobalt rich um, uh, kind of uh, inclusion. Here's another example. This is a, a, a rod of this bicolor material. So you have uh, the two ends of this are chromium free or, or at least very little chromium. And then the area in the center is, is heavily doped with chromium to produce the pink color. But that's all one single piece. So it's not assembled in any way. It's a single crystal. Another interesting entry in the, the 2020 issue of Gym News um, was this um, new deposit of uh, copper bearing sunstone um, from Ethiopia. So in the last few years, Ethiopia has been a big producer of um, new deposits. It kind of started with the opal deposits in the late two, uh, around 2008 or so. And then uh, uh, more recently, there was uh, quite a significant deposit of emeralds and sapphires. And so um, it seems that Ethiopia is really becoming quite a producer of a wide variety of gem materials. And uh, this sunstone certainly is no exception. Uh, we acquired samples um, in the international market. So these are F-type samples. So we haven't been to to the mine and witness the mining, but we were able to collect samples um, in Tokyo international markets and uh, samples were also collected in the Tucson gym show by uh, Stephen Challoner, who provided uh, those for us to examine. So what we did is we, we um, collected trace element chemistry from, from these samples to see if there was any sort of sy systematic difference in the chemistry compared to the uh, material that when we think about copper bearing sunstone, the Oregon material. So we looked at the chemistry profiles for both, both materials to see if they were different. And certainly they were. They were. And so that provided some confidence that this uh, new deposit um, is likely um, uh, real. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly, um, uh, obviously different in the chemistry from the Oregon material. So it does seem to be a new deposit of sunstone. Uh, in the microscope, you have um, copper platelets uh, exhaust throughout the stone, which is quite similar to the Oregon material. In transmitted light, these stones show these sort of interesting sort of uh, wispy red type structures and also had this sort of bluish uh, appearance in the, in the body color which that seemed to be a bit unusual. Um, also present were these yellow inclusions of phaolite, and that's something that you would also see in the Oregon material. So there are some similarities, uh, certainly to, to that material. But anyway, it's a, quite a fun new deposit um, of uh, feldspar from Ethiopia. Uh, it also, there's a, a new mineral uh, named after one of GIA's Board of Governors, Dr. Barbara Dutro, who is a, a professor at Louisiana State University. And so um, it was just a quite interesting new, new tourmaline variety called Dutroite, which you can see here in the photomicrograph. Um, so that was another news entry. In the lab notes for the summary issue, um, one of the one of the entries was a, a rather large um, uh, andradite garnet, and it was about forty nine carats, and so um, so it's brown in color. So it's just andradite. There's no demantoid variety because it's not green in color. Uh, it had lots of fibrous inclusions, which when light reflects on it, and because it's cut in an oval shape, you get this. A uh, nice cat's eye, so sort of an unusual large stone. The Tokyo lab um, documented this material that was found in, in the local market. 
Uh, it was being sold as Cal Sydney, but it certainly had the appearance of uh, Larmar, which um, is the mineral pectolite um, from the Caribbean. And, and what they found out was that this Cal Sydney had been uh, dyed with a copper solution, this sort of uh, blue color that's certainly reminiscent of Larimar. And then this material had been quench crackled to induce these fractures. And then the dye was bleached more rapidly in these fractures. So you get this sort of um, interlocking granular pattern that you would expect in uh, Larimar. And here's what the, some of the material looked like up close. You can see the fracture networks and you can see that the bleaching occurred um, was consistent with the fracture pattern. So this is where you have the removal of the color with some sort of bleaching agent that attacks the, the dye and breaks it down. You can also see this sort of banded structure, which is something that you would expect to see in a Cal Sydney and something that you wouldn't really expect to see in a piece of Larimar. Uh, especially cross-cutting all these this sort of fracture network. Here's what the samples looked like when they were cut open. And again, so this is an interior surface. And what you see is the color concentration is darker on the interior and lighter on the exterior. So that again is consistent with a, a post-dye bleaching process, which gives you this sort of mottled white and blue appearance. In the Bangkok lab, um, this stone was submitted for examination. And at first it has this, um, you know, the first impression is uh, Pariba tourmaline due to this sort of electric Windex blue type of color. And this stone was a little over five carats, but uh, testing confirmed that it was actually uh, the zinc silicate mineral hemimorphite. So sort of an unusual collector stone. Copper was also present, so that's certainly explanatory of the electric uh, blue color. In the Carlsbad laboratory, uh, we had the, the opportunity to examine this uh, rather unique and exceptional purple Montana sapphire. So the chemistry analysis confirmed that this is a Montana sapphire from one of the secondary deposits. Uh, it's hard to say which deposit exactly, but it could be Rock Creek, Missouri River or Dry Cottonwood Creek. Uh, certainly not a Yogo Sapphire, but this stone is unusual for its purple color and its large size, which was almost 10 and a half carats. So uh, really quite an exceptional stone. Uh, internally, the features were also consistent with a Montana Sapphire with lots of uh, Ruteo X solution particles and, and needles. In the Bangkok lab, um, gemologists there examined a blue sapphire that was um, treated with um, heat and pressure. And so this, uh, uh, this new sort of treatment appeared over oh, the last couple of years on the market uh, where sapphires are put into a large press, and they're packed in graphite, um, uh, pressure is applied as well as heat, and they're able to treat these stones in 20 minutes or so, as opposed to the, you know, tens or hundreds of hours that would normally be required for um, heat treating sapphire traditionally. Um, one of the features that you commonly get in these, um, these pressure treated sapphires are these recrystallized areas that you can see using polarized light where you have little corundum grains that are misoriented to the host. And so that can be a microscopic indication that you have a pressure treated sapphire. You also get this sort of lamellar type strain pattern, which is a little bit unusual, not something you'd expect to see in a stone treated traditionally or an untreated stone. But the really interesting thing uh, or reason why this was notable uh, from a laboratory perspective is that this stone contained a fluid inclusion um, uh, which is usually an indication that the stone has not been treated. So in the laboratory, if we find a negative crystal with carbon dioxide fluid, that's a, a sure sign that the stone's not been treated because the internal pressures upon heating um, will typically cause those negative crystals to rupture and the carbon dioxide fluid will leak out. Um, so if you actually can cool the stone down 
and get a CO2 bubble to form so that you have CO2 fluid and then just sort of this vapor phase at temperatures below 31 degrees Celsius or so. Um, then that tells you that the stone's not been heated uh, or at least it did until the um, until this treatment with pressure. And so the confining pressure of the treatment um, prevents the, in, the relative internal pressure from exceeding what the, the material strength of the corundum host can uh, withstand. So, so because it's being squeezed on the inside and the outside, there's, there's uh, no need for the stone to rupture. And so the CO2 um, is possible to be preserved inside. So what used to be a sure diagnostic indication of no heat, now must be interpreted with some caution. Fortunately, there was other things in the stone uh, which served to identify the heat treatment, namely the, the recrystallized areas and, and certainly some internal diffusion. This was a notable stone that came through um, the Carlsbad Laboratory. Typical, typically, when we think about the, the Mozambique corundum deposit, we, we associate that with all of the really nice Mozambique rubies that have come out. And this stone was, was rather large. It was a 11 carats, so pretty significant stone. It had this really intense pink color. And uh, the inclusions in the chemistry matched um, uh, Mozambique. And so we really don't see many Mozambique pink sapphires, especially um, stones of that caliber, but this was a really spectacular example. Uh, the inclusions otherwise are consistent with uh, lots of platy inclusions and, and rutile uh, particles here. And these negative crystals that are sometimes filled with mica and usually have these sort of equatorial halos around them. In the micro world section, we had um, a submission from the Bangkok laboratory. Uh, this was a sample that was collected by GIA on a field expedition in Russia uh, from, the, from the Emerald Mine there in the, uh, the Marinsky Prince mine, I believe. And what was interesting is that it contained these elongate rod-like inclusions of what turned out to be rutile. Uh, rutile in general is not particularly common in emerald, but it has been documented uh, certainly in emeralds from uh, North Carolina and I think occasionally in Zambia. Uh, but this stone was interesting because of the morphology where it's these really long exaggerated uh, needles of root tail. So certainly an interesting inclusion there. Another submission for the micro world column from the Tokyo laboratory uh, was a sapphire that had a negative crystal and the negative crystal contained carbon dioxide and also contained this dark hexagonal platy inclusion of what's almost certainly graphite. And the interesting thing is that much like the, the diamonds with the mobile diamond inclusion, uh, this graphite is free to move around in this negative crystal cavity. So uh, this registered photo series shows the negative crystal in the same place. And you can see that the, the graphite crystal has, has moved around this cavity. So certainly an interesting stone. Uh, another submission, this one was from the Bangkok laboratory. And they examined a sphalerite uh, gemstone that had this um, really fun zoning pattern. And um, since sphalerite is an isometric or cubic mineral, uh, when you're looking sort of in the octahedral direction, you can have this sort of threefold symmetry. And so it created this, um, this three-spoked windmill type pattern, uh, which was unusual, uh, certainly. Sphalerite's commonly zoned, but this is uh, this would not be a common type of appearance to expect to see in sphalerite. Also from the Bangkok laboratory for the micro world section um, was this radial spoke like pattern in emerald from Pakistan. So typically when we think about trapeci emeralds, uh, we think about those from Colombia where you have the spoke like pattern where you have sectors uh, that are, are divided by carbonaceous black material. So this stone didn't have the carbonaceous black material, but it still displayed this sort of radial pattern around a hexagonal core. So uh, interesting example of a trapeci type stone um, from Pakistan. 
And the quarterly crystal for the summer issue was this, um, this quartz crystal from the Shavor mine in Colombia. And commonly in emeralds from the Shavor mine, we, we see pyrite greens and pyrite crystals. And this quartz crystal also had, um, had really pristine uh, pyrite inclusions. Um, the stone is part of the John Quavela inclusion collection also. And these pyrite grains occur on this phantom plane. And uh, if you look at them up close, you see that the, the crystal faces are quite pristine and they have really sharp crystal faces. And that tells us that the, the quartz and the pyrite were uh, syngenetic or they were growing at the same time when they were incorporated into the, into the host quartz. Otherwise they would have much more rounded um, edges and wouldn't be quite as sharply defined. But uh, this was just a really nice example of, of pyrite inclusions in quartz, again from Colombia. For the, for the Gym News International uh, 2020 issue, uh, one of the most um, newsworthy stories that came out at that time was uh, a new deposit of pink diaspore. Um, now, new deposits are, of gym materials are pretty uncommon, and so this one uh, created a little bit of excitement, especially on social media. And uh, samples of this material were obtained by uh, Ian Nicastro uh, out of San Diego. And, and we collaborated with him on documenting this material. Um, so samples were from Afghanistan. Uh, we did trace element chemistry and spectra analysis to examine the cause of color. And the color is primarily due to uh, chromium and vanadium. They, um, uh, and typically you get diaspore, uh, most notably from Turkey. And the Turkish material is known for producing uh, color change. And so stones that go from sort of a, a greenish to pinkish kind of color. Uh, this material, one of the main questions that we also wanted to answer was, does this material show any type of significant color change? And the short answer is no, not really. Really, it's pretty much, it has a slight color shift where it goes from sort of a pure pink in uh, incandescent light to a slightly purple, purplish pink in a cooler light, but no, um, no color change. Uh, the inclusions contained inside were uh, fluid inclusions, uh, needle-like dark inclusions of rutile, and some of these hexagonal brown platelets of an unknown mineral that uh, we weren't able to identify. So certainly, uh, interesting new gym material on the market, so keep an eye out for that. Um, another entry in the Gym News International section was a significant stone um, cut by Viktor Tuslikov. Uh, if you've ever seen any of Viktor's work, it's quite obvious that he's one of the most skilled cutters that um, is faceting today, and so this stone was named uh, the fragility of the eternal. And so it's an uh, exceptionally large kunzite. I think it's a little over 3,000 carats. Uh, here you can see the, the strong pleochroism in the stone. So uh, looking at this direction, you see the, the dominant purple color, which is the color that is desired to be face up. And then when the stone's rotated 90 degrees, you see this sort of greenish color. Uh, here's what the fastening diagram looked like. Uh, Victor's pretty well known for his complex and very intricately patterned stones, and this one is certainly no exception. And here's the, the final stone um, finished out here. And so the, the rough started out at, uh, I believe, just under 3,000 uh, grams, and so the finished stone was just over 3,000 carats, so uh, really quite an exceptional stone. And um, this was a sort of an unusual entry uh, by Simon Bruce Lockhart and Wim Vertriest. Um, as everyone knows, there is a, a bit of a pandemic going on, which is what has uh, sparked all of these knowledge sessions in general, since we can't really meet uh, and have public lectures at the moment. And this entry highlighted the, the strange uh, uh, development that with the pandemic, there's not a lot of new rough material coming out on the international market. And so how do uh, gym dealers 
continue to supply new rough and new material in the gym trade. And the, the answer to that is they look at their stockpiles and their material that they've had hoarded away in their safe. And so what has happened is that um, in the case of this rather exceptional um, uh, tourmaline from, from Mozambique, it uh, has came out to the trade, uh, even though there's no new mining, someone had kind of uh, stashed this thrown away for maybe hard times like a pandemic and and released it out into the trade. And so this stone was really quite large, 85 grams, and it should cut an exceptional stone. And so it's just an interesting take on how the, the economic factors in the global situation with the pandemic have, have caused material that would otherwise be hidden away to, to be leaked out into the trade. Okay, and now it's time for a question and answer section. So I'll turn it back over to Stuart. Okay, Nathan, thank you very much for that. All right, I have a couple of questions for Sally first. So um, Sally, um, some of these entries have related to fluorescence and diamond. Uh, the question posed is, what are the most common fluorescence colors in diamond? Well, among uh, colorless and near colorless diamonds, it's certainly gonna be blue fluorescence due to the N3 center. Among uh, color diamonds, we get a lot more variety due to uh, the, more, the larger variety of defects that are present in colored diamonds and that they're present in high enough concentration to exhibit uh, color in the diamond. And so uh, among, <clears throat> so among uh, natural diamonds, uh, we can see uh, green fluorescence due to the H3 defect. We can see red to orange due to the nitrogen vacancy centers. Uh, we, we get some uh, different results among the lab-grown diamonds. Uh, typically, uh, colorless and near-colorless lab-grown diamonds, both HPHT and CD ground, do not show any observable fluorescence to long-wave uh, UV. And if they do show fluorescence, it's often more intense to short-wave UV. And among the uh, colored uh, uh, lab grown diamonds, if it's uh, pink, um, if it's pink, we'll typically see the orange to red due to the nitrogen vacancy centers. Uh, that's the predominant cause of color among uh, the treated pinks and among the lab grown uh, pinks that uh, have been post growth treated to, to create nitrogen vacancy centers. All right, thank you, Sally. Mm -hmm. And um, also that really cool solid carved diamond ring that you talked about. Um, if that rough hadn't been used to carve this particular ring, do we know what that, that rough would have been used for? Would it be for industrial purposes or, or what? Well, there is a number of, of stones that have been uh, faceted uh, using that sort of material. It'll often present as a fancy dark gray or fancy black face up. And so we do see a, a number of natural diamonds that do have those uh, graphite needles uh, as that cause of as uh, with having that as their cause of color for the fancy blacks, I, I thought it was really uh, unique to uh, to you take advantage of the size of this rough to create a really unique piece, where in which the whole piece of jewelry is diamond. Yeah, and a follow up question on that. Um, so, do you know would they have used lasers to carve that? Uh, I. I'm not fully sure about that. Uh, so just to preface, I'm not fully sure, but I imagine that yes, lasers were involved in some way with that carving. All right. Okay, well now that Nathan's had time to catch his breath, we'll uh, turn to him with a few questions. Um, the spring 2020 Microworld entry on Bavenite and Quartz, do we know the locality for that? Um, I think, I think it was maybe Brazil, but I can't remember for sure if it was, uh, if, if we had a confident answer on the locality. Okay. All right. And um, the uh, spring 2020 microworld entry on the reversible twinning and neodymium pentaphosphate, that's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. Do we know why that yes. twinning reversal was accompanied by a clicking sound? Well, it's, you know, it's when you are kind of applying pressure to that stone, you're, um, you're creating this sort of elastic deformation. And then eventually 
the as the twinning um, happens throughout the whole crystal, all that energy is suddenly kind of released. And so you're getting this as you apply the pressure, you're you're almost storing the energy in the crystal. Then once you um, once the, the the crystal actually twins and and goes the other direction, that energy gets sort of released back. And I think that's what's causing the clicking uh, sound. Okay. Um, the, uh, the lab note on bismuth glass filled Burmese ruby. Do we know anything about the stability of that bismuth glass filling? Um, I don't know that we've done the same degree of testing on the bismuth glass, but I would expect it to be pretty comparable to the lead glass uh, filling as far as stability goes. Um, you know, in, in general, this material is, is heated just at enough of a temperature to cause the glass to melt, which is, as far as corundum goes, is pretty low. So, um, so the stability wise, if the glass were to not be there and the glass were to decompose it all through acid or etching or something like that, uh, if the stone falls apart because it's not been heated at a high enough temperature to actually fuse those fractures together, that's where the stability concern is. And so, as we saw in that X-ray image, those fractures go throughout the whole stone. So if you remove the glass by acid etching or something like that, um, then the stone would not be stable. So uh, that's why we'd go manufactured product for that type of material. All right. And I uh, see a couple of questions that have come in late. Um, back to you, Nathan. Uh, do we know the approximate size of the loose inclusions in those, uh, those two diamonds presented, the diamond within diamond? So, so the, the Matryoshka diamond, um, I think the weight on that inclusion was estimated to be about three points. And um, having examined the other one, I haven't measured the volume of the inclusion, but it was smaller than the Matryoshka diamond. So I would imagine it to be somewhere on the order of one point. All right. Okay, another one uh, for you, Nathan. Um, a question on the Pariba rough tourmaline. Mm -hmm. um, is that the usual, is that a usual color for the rough is the question. Um, so, so for the, for the Mozambique deposit, that's certainly not an unusual color. It's a little bit on the purplish side. And so the Mozambique material was commonly um, heated. And, and so to get the purple color, you have the blue component coming from copper. And then you also have sort of a pink component coming from manganese. And so when they heat that material, they alter the oxidation state of the manganese eliminating the pink color and then what you're left with is sort of the pure blue color. So the implication there is that when you see this sort of purplish color in the Mozambique material, that's before it's been heat treated to get that sort of electric Windex blue color that you'd expect in Pariba tourmaline. All right and um, I think we have time for a couple more. Let's jump back to you Sally. Um, how can you tell if a diamond is naturally colored or color treated? Well, there's, big question. yes, that's, that's, that is a big question and it depends a lot on, uh, you can't give a simple answer. There's really no black box yet uh, to be able to be able to do that. For any diamond that you're not sure about, uh, if it's natural color or not, I recommend you submit it to a demological laboratory. There are a couple of trends that we can talk about. One is, is that if a diamond is uh, colorless to near colorless, and it has a diamond type as type 1A, then we can uh, feel comfortable that it is natural. And there's, um, <clears throat> and there's a, lo a lot of things rely on uh, looking at spectroscopy. Uh, sometimes you can look at features in a diamond and determine that it has a natural origin that it grew within the earth, such as seeing trigons on the surface or seeing um, earth-grown inclusions, such as uh, the ones we talked about earlier that had corundum or, or kyanite or olivine. All of those are indicative that it was naturally grown, but it doesn't uh, yet guarantee that something was not, that the color was not subsequently treated. So there are a couple of things that you can look for. But uh, 
but still it is a, a very, can be a very challenging for a gemologist to be able to discern that. And so for anything that you're unsure about, we do recommend submitting it to a gemological laboratory uh, where we have the spectroscopy tools that are necessary to help us make that conclusion. Great, thank you, Sally. And uh, one last question, this one's for you, Nathan. Uh, one of our attendees uh, says she has a tourmaline represented as, and I quote, neon, I'm sorry, neon titanium tourmaline from Botswana. And she'd like to know if um, that material has been studied by GIA. Um, I can't say that I recall anything fitting that description specifically, but uh, you know, tourmaline is a little bit of uh, what they call a trash can mineral. So it often has a wide variety of chemistries and, and colors. And so um, whether or not we buy, examine that material specifically, I, I would say I'm not sure. Okay. All right, well, that wraps up our Q&A. So um, uh, before we go, I'd like to uh, just give you a reminder that every g, &G up through the latest issue can be downloaded for free by visiting our website. That's gia.edu backslash gems hyphen gemology. And you can also subscribe or purchase print issues by visiting the GIA store. That's the one on the right. And if you haven't already, be sure to join the g, &G Facebook group. 11,000 members strong, really vibrant community. And we're always, we have a steady stream of fresh content all the time. And finally, mark your calendars for the next GIA knowledge session. That's gonna be three weeks from today on January 7. Dr. Mike Breeding will be on hand to discuss yellow and orange diamonds. So on behalf of everyone at GIA, thank you for joining us today.